Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk, coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming on nccradio.org. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. This program is repeated on Sundays at 11 p.m. So hi there, my name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends on when you are listening or watching. Oh, Gewalt! You can actually see us right now on Facebook Live at my page, facebook.com forward slash Antral Pearl. So hello on the radio, hello on the line, and hello to the world. I know my voice sounds uh, upbeat, but you know, it is indeed a very sad moment. Why is that, my friends? In case you don't know, the bodies of six hostages abducted by, uh, alive by Hamas on October the 7th were recovered yesterday from a tunnel in southern Gaza's Rafah overnight, shortly after they were murdered by the terrorists, as reported by the Israeli Defense Forces. The hostages were Hashem Yimkom Domam, Hirsch Goldberg Polin, 23, 23 years old, Eden Yerushalmi, 24, Ori Danino, 25, Alex Lubnov, 32, Carmel Gutt, 40, and Almog Sarusi, 27. My friends, all of them were abducted from the Nova Music Festival near the Kibbutz Raim, while Gutt was taken from Kibbutz Be'eri. Their bodies were found with gunshot wounds to the head and other parts of their bodies. My friends, an autopsy found that they were murdered in the past 48 hours prior to the discovery of their bodies. It is indeed a sad morning. At the same time, my friends are just coming together, as you may know, that this past week was the conclusion of the 11 months since October the 7th. And some 1,200 families are now concluding the saying of the mourners' Kaddish, the initial families who lost members during that October the 7th massacre. They were murdered on Simchas Torah, on the date that we'll never forget, October the 7th. And as you well know, the custom is to recite the Kaddish prayer three times a day for 11 months. So even though on the one hand there's the conclusion of that the initial loss of life and the 11 months concluded this past week, sadly, the Kaddish continues, as we've just mentioned on the, on the most recent captives found murdered. And I want to share a little moment, and I want to let you know what happened in our shul at Congregation Beth Shalom Chabad in Mineola. One of our members, unknown to me until months since October the 7th, took upon himself, not related to anybody in Israel and anybody who'd taken being captive or lost their life at that time, took upon himself to say the Kaddish, to say Kaddish in our shul. And, of course, he concluded because... We only say it for 11 months. What's the meaning of the words of this prayer, which was recited over and over again this year and sadly still continues? The Kaddish opens with the mourners expressing their desire to glorify and sanctify the magnificent name of Hashem. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabba. The words that follow describe a perfect world that has achieved its rectification and we beseech the Almighty God that His presence should be further magnified as we say in the Kaddish itself, blessed and praised, glorified and exalted, extolled and honored, adored and lauded. And the question is, why are these words recited by a mourner after losing a loved one? 
And here, my friends, is something extraordinarily important to understand. Since every human being is created in God's image, when a person passes away, God's revelation in this world is diminished somewhat. Dear friends, that's how we see life. But every single one of us brings holiness to this world. Something holy is now missing from our world. Think of all those who've lost their lives as captives with Hashem's help. All those who are still alive should come out very speedily. So when we lose a life, lose a loved one, we know that something is diminished, something important, something holy has left in this world. And therefore, the Kaddish is our request that the divine light, that that individual brought to this world. Yes, there are those individuals who do the opposite of bringing darkness and mayhem. But we've always, wherever we've gone throughout the world, we've always brought productivity, kindness, uplifting values, morality. So when a, when a person has passed away, we know that a divine light that was filled by the individual is now missing. And we need to immediately increase to fill that void. That is performed, that is recognized, that is yearned upon through the Kaddish that we say. And of course, this year, that void is almost unfathomable when we think about the terrible massacre, October the 7th. So as this period of Kaddish ends for the initial group, this initial loss of life, the first 11 months, it was amazing, it was heartwarming to see that in our shul, an individual took upon themselves to identify and say the Kaddish at every moment. And those who diligently recited the Kaddish three times daily were really assisted by many volunteers in Israel and throughout the world and who agree to um, what, what, what was basically going on by this individual in our shul and about those across the world who did the same thing is the importance of um, what, 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 why is there a, why is there a, a um, <clears throat> why, why on earth is there a, a Kaddish said to, to begin with is to appreciate to appreciate that is something done in in a in a group in a in a um, in a minion, saying Kaddish at home by oneself is a very nice feeling, but at the end of the day, it's, do, it's not the same as saying it in a minion, in a group, in a community. It's never said alone. It requires the presence of at least, at least nine other men. Reciting, reciting the um, Kaddish in a minion sends the mourners a powerful and comforting message that you're not alone. May we soon see the fulfillment of the closing of the Kaddish recited by so many broken-hearted words. What are the, the last lines that we see on, on, this, uh, on the Kaddish? And that is that may we see, may we see, may, may we soon see the fulfillment of the closing words of the Kaddish. Oise Shalom bin Romov he who makes peace in his heights, may he make peace upon us and upon all. Let us all say, Amen. Let us continue in our, our uh, discussion on this and to appreciate. We'll come back to this in a moment. But first, I'd like to address a question that was uh, asked of me by Newsday. And uh, Newsday asked me recently to write a little piece about what does, what does your faith say about send, uh, finding a perfect mate? Right? What does Jerusalem say about finding, you know, one's, one's, uh, one's, one's uh, <laughs> you know, uh, mate? And the question is, is marriage predestined or dependent on your efforts? The answer is both. Like everything in life, we are partners with God in creation. 
The divine sends each soul off on its unique journey through life and designates which soul belongs with another. But God's efforts require our joint venture. Through our virtue and prayer, by being better people, we engage God in the mysterious and arduous process of joining souls together. The heavenly voice is not a decree, but it merely reflects the soulmate's natural com you know, compatibility. Their inherent nature predisposes them, and it makes it easier to choose each other. But they do not uh, do so out of free... But they, they, it's absolutely through free choice. They are guided by God to meet each other based on their merits, not by preordained decree. It's with human prayer, with our prayers and merits, that helps to expedite and ease the process. Understanding the Jewish view of marriage also informs us the way we date. Dating for marriage is very different from dating for fun. If dating means to search for our soulmate, our other half, our search must not only be fun and exciting, but also courageous, proactive, and focused. And this raises our prospects for an enduring marriage. When? When each gives the other what the other needs. That includes validation and feeling cherished. Continuing our thoughts of the tragedies, the ongoing tragedies in the, the land in Israel, I want to share with you the, um, the question that's now starting to, you know, kind of be discussed in the Jewish communities with the first, the first anniversary of October the 7th coming up. The actual English date is on the Monday between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. That's the actual, on the Gregorian calendar, October the 7th. But of course, we all know that the ultimate, the ultimate date is the actual Shemini Atzeres, or in, in Israel, Simchas Torah, which is at the end of the holiday of uh, Sukkot. And many people are uh, questioning and asking, how, how should we uh, celebrate Simchas Torah this year on the beginning of such a um, such a sad moment of what happened. How how do we how are we supposed to reflect during this time? So this is just the beginning of some thoughts about this, um, of how how we are going to deal with this. The um, increasingly, of course these questions are coming up after the brutal massacre that occurred on last Simchas Torah in Israel. So how are we supposed to commemorate it? How can we dance, right? Simchas Torah is related to dancing, singing, but how can we do that and celebrate with the memory of what took place on that day? Is it uh, simply a, a turn the day into a Yiska memorial ceremony? And we all know that in Israel, Shemini Atzeres and Simchas Torah is all one day, and that does include the Yiska memorial ceremony. Outside of Israel, it, be, it is two days. But again, is it just simply, are we supposed to turn the day into one big Yiska? These are, these are obviously halachic questions, but at the same time, the gamut of subjective human experience of what we went through has to be taken into, into account. Each of us experiences life differently so that celebration and mourning have different meanings to different people. At any rate, um, an important perspective as we discuss this has to lead us to realizing a deeper understanding and deeper realization of what it means to be a Jew when we face these issues. Which means to say, let's look how we have dealt with such situations in the past. And sadly, there's no, no shortage of them. And let's take some guidance from there. The first thing I'd like to share 
a general observation. The difference between commemoration versus commiseration. A commemoration is very Jewish. Commemoration, however, is not commiseration. Why would that be? Because commemoration sustains us as a people. Commiseration strangles us. In Judaism, we rely on shared memory that holds us together. A story that explains ourselves to ourselves. We live inside a story much as others live inside a country. Take an Italian out of Italy, and within a generation or two, you've taken Italy out of the Italian. But for us, no matter where in the world, we remain who we are. But a Jew who steps outside of the Jewish narrative is really a fish on a dry land, or a man on the moon without a spaceship. This doesn't mean we live in the past. Quite contrary, what I'm going to share with you is that clearly throughout our history, everything we do has to also be predicated on what our children hear from us. More than just about what happened to our ancestors, to have in mind how we move forward. In fact, with a memory of an event that has not yet come, that's how we became a nation. That's the mother of all Jewish memory. Let me share with you. Let's visit that for a moment. Um, when we all assembled to leave Egypt, as the story climaxed, it was about to unfold, there was a great march forward, onwards, to getting to the promised land. It was still a dream. It was a far journey. It ended up being 40 years after leaving Egypt. But what, how did Moses address the people at that time? While they were at that moment in Egypt, he said, remember this day. What did he talk about? Remember this present moment for what it will mean to your children yet unborn. Every decision that we make must be predicated on not only what we think ourselves, but what will our children and grandchildren be thinking in the future? What decision do I make today that has an impact on that future? Well, what did Moses tell us? To ensure our children would know about how Egypt didn't, didn't focus on, said, you know what the children should know about how Egypt at that time duped us and oppressed us. He didn't tell us never to let go of the suffering and the trauma we had survived. He didn't say, never forget the sting of Pharaoh's whip. He told us to remember the day we left all that behind. We constantly remind ourselves of leaving Egypt, the leaving. Not what happened there so much, but we left there. We've moved forward. In other words, that commemoration of the past isn't about the past at all. It is about the future. It is a story that we tell our children so that they will know who they are and carry our vision forward. Commiseration, on the other hand, is entirely about the past, and it buries us there. I often go to Holocaust memorial gatherings and uh, museums, both on Long Island and uh, in New York, and I always make the point or appreciate the fact that even though I'm a second-generation Holocaust survivor and my father went through it in, in the worst of ways. He was a slave laborer chosen by Mengele Yamach Shemoy and worked in the camps laying down the um, railroad tracks and all the other things and all the stories that went through, the beatings, etc. My father made a point not to, uh, to even, no, no, made, a, made the, an important point of moving us forward, of bringing us up in the true spirit of who we were, not uh, focusing every day on the Holocaust. One can feed a child 
a huge diet of Holocaust memorials and gatherings and pictures and memories, but that does not guarantee a Jewish future. That only focuses on the past and could even sadly for many leave a very negative feeling. It's all about moving forward. Maybe in the, towards the end of my father's life of blessed memory did he first speak about his terrible experiences there. All his life he worked hard for his family and gave us the best of Jewish education, uplifting a passionate excitement about who we were to make sure that there was a future, future in so many different ways. So a person who simply goes and gets assaulted, you know, their eyes, so to speak, by, by the, you know, the, portray the portraying of skeletons and starving figures at these Mora gatherings behind barbed wires, it has its place, my friend, it has its place. But you can't just leave ourselves, our children and grandchildren with materials for nightmares. You can't do that. Um, because otherwise we're, we're left with a with a, with, a, with unanswered questions. Why would I want to be part of suffering and persecution? Uh, people uh, presented themselves in, in dry bones, you know, in a, in a wire cage. That is when we forget the bigger story. When we left Egypt, the focus was moving forward, moving forward. The, the liberation from Egypt, the promise was to return to the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant that Hashem had made with his holy nation. We can't just leave it, you know, toss it into the bin of uh, mythology of uh, Charlton Heston and Cecil B. DeMille. All they had left to offer is meaningless suffering. When you think that way, you get stuck in the past. What does our history show us? How we've, in the past, commemorated massacres. One of the most horrific massacres of Jews, under the most disastrous circumstances, was the Roman butchery of the great metropolis of Betar. It occurred 52 years after the devastation of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Second Temple. The Jerusalem Talmud paints a picture of the Roman cavalry sadistically spilling the blood of every man, woman, and child until the horses were up in it, in the blood, up to their nostrils. It was a calculated measure of the empire, the Roman Empire, to not only squash the Bar Kokhba revolt, but also to extinguish the final glowing cinders of hope. But it didn't. You can't attribute that to the wisdom. You can actually absolutely focus on why we're still around because we must give credit to the wisdom and the foresight of our sages at that time. How did they respond? The Talmud explains, Emperor Hadrian cruelly prohibited the uh, Jews of that time to even bury bury the corpses of Beta. It was only several years later that Emperor Antoninus, a, benefic a beneficent monarch, he granted permission for the bodies to be buried. But miraculously, the bodies had not decomposed. Until then, there were only three blessings recited after a meal. Now, the sages of Yavna added a fourth, to thank God for preserving the bodies and bringing them to a proper burial. And the question is, how do we commemorate the massacre of Betar in our prayers? How do we do that? Every time we thank God for the food and the good land he has given us, we include a long blessing. It's called Hatoiv Vahametiv, praising God who is good and does good. Hey, what about our tears, our horror? What about our outrage with God? If he's so good, how did he allow such a thing to happen? So the great sages put all of that aside for the moment because they knew that the very existence of the nation was at stake. Tears and outrage have a place, but they won't save a people for an extinction. Gratitude for every ray of hope will. 
our sages knew when you tell the story, think of what your children will hear. I'm reminded of the fact that um, many families, you know, immigrants came to America and they were determined to give their children everything that they didn't have. But sadly, what was missing is that those earlier ancestors of ours forgot to give their children what they did have. It's great to work hard on what we didn't have, but equally we must pass on of what we do have. That's the future. Every time we live, every time we breathe, every time we act, every time we make a comment about Jewish life and about life in general, remember the next generation are listening. What do they hear from us? Do they hear about the oys of Judaism, the oys of, of being who we are, or do they hear the joys of who we are? Um, the, the, uh, dear friends, I just want to let you know that uh, we are having some uh, difficulty with our Facebook connection, and uh, if we're able to reestablish, we'll let you know. Meanwhile, hopefully, uh, you can actually hear us live even if you're out of range of 90.3 FM, you go on to the online to um, you go on online to nccradio.org, www.nccradio.org, and you will find, hear us loud and clear. So um, this is what we have to take into consideration. I will go as far as to say that we do not commemorate tragedies at all. Not in the same way as, um, as, as classic historians who they speak about simply uh, that uh, we commemorate what happened in history. That's not what it's all about. It's much deeper than that. We never commemorate the past for the sake of the past. We commemorate the past with a purpose. For the future it will bring. This is the entire concern of all the books of the prophets, indeed the entire Tanakh. Let's think about Tisha B'av. On the day the temple was destroyed twice in history, first by the Babylonians and then by the Romans, we sit on the floor fasting and reading lamentations. We avoid any activity that brings joy, including any Torah study that is not about the destruction. We include lam laments composed following the massacres of the Crusades, since the Jews of that era saw their troubles as an outcome of our exile. And for the same reason, we, we include also about the Holocaust, and this year we added l uh, lamentations over the loss of life on October the 7th. Nevertheless, Tisha B'Av has nothing to do with commemorating the past. It's entirely about here and now. And the same is with all the fast days of the calendar. The sages put it this way, if the temple is not rebuilt in our days, it may well have been destroyed in our days. As long as we are without a spiritual nucleus, we remain a people searching for our soul. This is the core of our exile, exile from our authentic state of being. That also sits at the heart of every tragedy that befalls us which is why we heap all the mourning for all those events together on one day. Everything is about that search for our lost soul. Think about this. Why, why, why do we visit the Western Wall in Jerusalem? The rest of the world visits their historical landmarks to see what is there. We visit this one, the Western Wall, to see what is missing? On Tisha B'Av, we feel the pain of that loss more than the other day, as though the Roman legions were set, setting Jerusalem on fire before our own eyes. Pain has a purpose. It is a signal that something is wrong and needs to be healed. So on Tisha B'Av, we cease masking our pain, peel off the bandages of distractions, and fully expose ourselves to the pain of a shared inner emptiness. We feel the loss of something essential to our people as a whole in each of us as individuals and return to ourselves. 
As the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, once put it, imagine the scene. They're setting their holy temple on fire. Standing nearby is one of us, an ordinary emotional, emotionless personality, a completely stone-hearted individual witnessing the destruction as it takes place. Without question, even such a person would turn his entire world upside down to do whatever he could to stop it. Says the Torah, the guide of our life, let's turn our world upside down today. Ironic but poignant, Tisha B'Av is called a moed, meaning a holiday or special time. To me, it has always felt a surreal, kind of even paradoxical. Along with all the practices of mourning are certain practices that mark the day as a joyous day. Yeah, joyous day on Tisha B'Av. The great Kabbalist Rabbi Yitzhak Luria explains that it is indeed a joyous festival that simply has yet to break out of his shell. Once the Mashiach comes and we complete our repair of all that's been broken, the fast days of the year will become festivals and Tisha B'Av will be the most joyous of them all. This is the optimism, the hope and the faith that we have lived by for all these thousands of years. With every disaster, we focus on what urgently needs to be done today to repair what has been broken. In every tragedy, we see the opportunity for a yet more joyous future. The same is with a yard site, the annual anniversary of someone who passed away. We honor the memory of those who have left us this, this, this world for the, for the next by leading the prayers, learning some Torah on their behalf and giving charity on their behalf. We assist them to climb to a higher place in the higher world by lifting ourselves up in this world. We live the Torah of life, and life means doing something now for the sake of the future. The joy of Simcha's Torah is a powerful message to us and to our children. And what is that? We are alive. Torah is alive. We celebrate our Judaism, our Torah, our lives, no matter what. Yes, we also say Yiska, commemorating the loved ones who have passed on to the next world. And that too is with joy. It's a solemn joy, perhaps, but a deep one. The joy that we have not lost our connection with them. That is why only those with a father or, or mother in the, in the other world are permitted to stay in the synagogues because for others there is not that joy. And on Yom, on Yom Tov, there can only be joy. I bring you back to 1969. There was an individual called Svi Hirsch Gansburg. 1969, only six days earlier, he had lost his wife to leukemia. He brought his five children to a small synagogue in East Flatbush and danced with joy, a joy that infected even the, the you know, everybody in, in the congregation a sincere inner joy that lit other souls aflame. Well, after doing that, he joined, he went back to 77 Eastern Parkway and uh, to, go, to, ga to join the Rebbe who was giving at the Fabrengen. The Rebbe was still talking and preparing for the late Hakafas. And he joined with everybody else. Now, this individual was the man who always began the next song. In between the talks, they would sing a song. So everybody looked upon him, all quite aware of what it just had been through, losing his wife just six days earlier to the terrible illness. He started his song. His strong, his, his, it was a very gentle voice, but he began a very defiant Russian song. The translation is, We in water will not drown and in fire will not burn. At that moment, back in 69, the crowd was, so to speak, set aflame by his fire, by his enthusiasm. And they shouted out the song with fervor. The Rebbe stared at him with a piercing gaze, then jumped up, pushing back his chair, clapping and dancing in his place encouraging, fanning the flames of every soul in the room. 
We must remember, my friends, we are like the burning bush that is never consumed. In water, we do not drown. In fire, we do not burn. We are here until all the darkness of the world has perished. We will dance and sing this Simchas Torah until the whole world dances with us. I um, will now continue, my friends, and for those who may be concerned, we I do have had some uh, difficulties with our Facebook connection, and uh, hopefully it will be fixed in time for another program. But let's continue. Please tell your friends that we can uh, be seen and uh, we can be heard, I should say, on nccradio.org. That gives you the opportunity to hear us online, online, live, and wherever you are. Um, I want to bring you, bring you to uh, an insight of uh, what you most probably are reading about currently. In June, the NASA astronauts Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore embarked on a mission to the ICC, the International Space Station, aboard Boeing Starliner spacecraft. Initially planned, their trip was for eight days. However, a malfunction with the spacecraft's system or population propulsion system during the test flight for their return home altered their plans dramatically. And the engineers concluded that it would not be safe to return the astronauts to Earth at that time, leading to an unexpected extension that would now be stuck up there for another eight months. Now, NASA and Boeing officials have been uh, notably careful in their choice of words regarding this situation. They have avoided terms like stuck and stranded, which could be seen as negative and reflect poorly on their operations. Instead, they've described the extended stay in more neutral or positive terms. SUNY Williams, reflecting on their prolonged mission, also sidestepped any negative language. She shared, Butch and I have been up here before, and it feels like coming home. It's great to be here, so I'm not complaining. Her perspective highlights their ability to adapt to unexpected changes with a positive outlook. Yet, some critics have pointed out that calling the situation an extended stay can seem, uh, I guess, disingenuous. The president of the Varda Space Industries expressed his frustration on social media comparing their situation to being stranded at an airport for seven additional months. The analogy underscores a more critical view of their predicament, suggesting that the terms used to describe the situation may downplay the reality of being, indent- uh, I, I guess, indefinitely away from Earth. The Starliner spaceship that initially brought Williams and Wilmot to the ISS will return to Earth unmanned. The astronauts are scheduled to return in February aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. Despite their extended stay, they have enough supplies and have expressed no concern about their situation. Wilmore's wife, Deanna, conveyed to the Associated Press that her husband is content at the space station. She emphasized that he is not worried or distressed, finding comfort in the belief that God is in control, which brings great peace to their family. The experience of being unexpectedly confined or delayed resonates with many of us, with all of us in everyday life. Think about this. We frequently encounter situations where plans are disrupted, such as canceled flights, hospital stays, unexpected business trips, long lines, or guess what, the LIE, the Long Island, uh, you know, (laughs) the traffic jams. In such moments, it can be challenging to maintain a positive outlook and view these disruptions as merely, (laughs) 
as extended stays than as a frustrating setback. Sapir Cohen, who was abducted from near Oz on October the 7th and held captive by the Hamas, your Mahshamam, for 55 days, provides a poignant example of adapting to an unforeseen and challenging situation. Initially, Cohen grappled with the intense feelings of distress and self-doubt, replaying her decisions and questioning why she ended up in, the, in this predicament. She wondered if different choices might have altered her life. After several days of torment and mental anguish, Cohen experienced a significant shift in her perspective. She resolved to accept her situation as part of God's plan, focusing on her mission rather than her suffering. During her captivity, Cohen was held alongside a teenage girl who was struggling immensely. Cohen's shift in mindset led her to dedicate herself to helping the girl. She offered encouragement, ensured the girl received enough food, and used humor to alleviate the girl's fears. When they were moved to tunnels, Cohen even used a bit of humor to reassure the girl by pointing out that the Gaza tunnels are a notable feature and they might as well make the most of their experience. Cohen's positive attitude and determination to support the girl helped transform the situation from one of helplessness to one of hope and resolve. After 55 days, Cohen and the girl, Baruch Hashem, were released in a final prisoner swap on November the 30th. The release brought relief, and many continued to hope for the safe return of Cohen's uh, boyfriend, Sasha, and all the other hostages. The Torah describes the journeys of the children of Israel through the wilderness, listing 42 encampments. This enumeration might seem to highlight mere stops, but the Lubavitch Rebbe explained that these encampments were not endpoints, but rather way stations in a broader journey towards the Promised Land. Each stop was an integral part of reaching their ultimate destination. Similarly, life's interruptions and challenges, though often seen as obstacles, are part of a larger journey. Each pause or setback can serve as a stepping stone towards achieving our greater goals. These unplanned detours can sometimes be the very experience that propels us forward, helping us to grow and progress towards our ultimate mission in life. Just as astronauts like Williams and Wilmore make the best of their extended time and space, we can learn to find purpose and meaning in our own unanticipated delays and obstacles. Recognizing that, that we're always where we need to be and focusing on our mission can transform these challenges into opportunities for growth and fulfillment. Embracing this perspective allows us to navigate life's unexpected turns with resilience and optimism. I want to... How we look at life and how we see things is something very, very important to all of us. Only yesterday, the Torah reading speaks about seeing our unique circumstances as a blessing. What do we read? We read, Re'e, God says, I've set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Now, I set before you this day as a blessing and a curse can be read as, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. In other words, the day itself is a blessing or a curse, this day, focusing on this moment, the day, the present moment, the now that is presented to each of us each day anew can be viewed as and made into a blessing or a curse. I've set before you a blessing and a curse means the choice is up to us. It is up to us whether it is a blessing or, heaven forbid, a curse. Rather, than being mere recipients of life, dealing with whatever is presented to us, we can be co-creators in life, living 
from the inside out and choosing to interpret reality proactively. We can be the director of our own f f uh, film. We have the choice to see life and recognize that all of it is in place to help us achieve blessing or the opposite. Blessing means to proliferate, to increase, to flow, to progress and evolve higher. To see life as a blessing means to behold everything as a tool, an opportunity to help us flow forward, advance and grow. All circumstances can be leveraged for living more authentically, being in touch with our deepest nature and achieve our soul's purpose in the world. The... Um, Every encounter, every experience, even challenges and setbacks can help us progress spiritually and better our lives. This is how to see blessings everywhere. And indeed, when we live in a way that we see everything as a blessing, we ourselves become a blessing. So, I've set before you this day. What you have is this day. Not yesterday or not tomorrow. And every day is totally a new day. Just as no two people are the same, since the beginning of creation, no two days have ever been the same. Now, nor, in fact, have two moments been the same. Every day and every moment brings with it new opportunities to create blessings. Paradoxically, change is the only constant in life. Every prayer is a new prayer, says the Arizal, and therefore teaches the Baal Shem Tov. Every distraction during prayer is a new distraction. Every prayer, every mitzvah, distraction, challenge, and test is given to us in order to lift us up, to grow, to develop ourselves. Every detail, and in fact, the entire context of each day is really placed before us so that we will see it or leverage it as a blessing. Everything in creation was created by the infinitely wise and compassionate one for a reason. It is up to us to recognize and harness the present potential for the service of Hashem and bringing life, hope, and possibilities to everything around us. And from this perspective, everything within and around us is actively conspiring to help us achieve our purpose in existing. Our genetics, parents, upbringing, education, environment, nature, nurture, all perfectly designed to present us with the choice of creating good from, from it or the opposite. A deliberate activity that we all that we do in order to move forward towards attaining our soul's purpose in Hebrew is called Zahir Tfe, which means carefully performed act. Zahir, carefully, can also be translated illuminated or shines. Um, what does that mean? The um, Zahir. Every aspect of our life and environment and culture and history is meant to be a catalyst for attaining our individual soul illumination in the best possible manner. Even the challenges and the obstacles that arise are only there to provoke us to marshal our deep strengths and resources to persevere and to shine. A blessing is an enlargement, so to speak, of our divine soul expression, a revelation of more of who we truly are. From our first moments in life, we've been placed in conducive environments for the development and the articulation of our soul powers. When we do not listen to our soul calling, basically we are deviating from who we really are, and that is a curse. A curse is defined as a concealment or a severing of our flow of life and illumination and an alienation of our essential holiness and wholeness. 
there never was nor will there ever be another you. And there never was and never will be again a moment like this. This means that the most important time is now. And the most valuable person is you right now in this place. Then you and the now are coming together in a firm choice to manifest blessings. That is what it's all about. So, in a nutshell, let's see our circumstances as a blessing. This week, we receive the strength, the inspiration, to be more deeply understanding of our unique journeys and the ever-unfolding blessing in the present moment guiding us along this journey. We receive support in choosing to see our unique circumstances in life as pushing us towards our authentic self and motivating us to actually to actualize our inner purpose and why we're here. We have the ability, we are empowered to be more of who we are. This week, we should view the context of life we are given as a unique blessing meant just for us. And this way, everything will become illuminated and we will be a blessing for ourselves and others. So I guess you could say the practice, the practice of the week is choose, choose to see and be a blessing. In the uh, moments, in the few moments that we still have in our program, I want to say again, thank you to everybody listening today. Even though we had some problems getting on the world of Facebook, but please pass the message. Uh, please be aware that we're also live on nccradio.org. That's the website for this great station, 90.3 uh, WHPC. And... Uh, we can get the message, and this this program will obvi will be all be um, on the platforms later on, as we place this, and you can get the full program again as well. One of the one of the um, I guess one of the important things when we pray, we talk about prayer and thinking deep during during the uh, prayer services, typically. A Jewish prayer shawl is worn. It's called a talit in Hebrew. It's one of the most iconic Jewish objects. And when we think of prayer, Jewish prayer, we think of people praying wrapped in their talit. Many works of art depict people praying and studying enveloped in their talit. Many use the talit, the prayer shawl, as the, 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 the top of the, the chuppah the roof, so to speak, of the chuppah at their wedding. The talit is so s symbolic of Judaism that the state of Israel based the design of the Israeli flag on it. The talit is a woven piece of cloth with square corners. On each corner are tassels called tzitzits. The Torah describes that the blue strings should be included in the fringe which the Talmud says must come from a specific sea creature called Chilazon, a type of snail. The identity of this creature was lost for centuries, which is why only white strings are used in the tzitzis today. Many, much effort has been made in recent years to correctly identify this animal, and some people have once again started to wear white and blue tassels. But every element of the talus is rich with deeper symbolisms. We may not be able to cover it completely, but I just share some of them. The actual tassels, we call them, tzitzis, there are actually eight, eight on, um, eight strands hanging on the four corners. And they're tied before you have the, uh, the uh, loose tassels, the tzitzis, it's, there's, uh, there's a, a set of five knots Eight and five is um, 13. T together with the word tzitzis, numerically comes the word 613. When a person puts on the talit, the prayer shawl, he's being reminded he's enveloped by the 613 mitzvahs. And there's so much more 
that is related to that. The, um, the idea. Clothing is used to conceal one's body and provide modesty. However, because of its non-rigidity, clothing also allows the shape of the person to be discernible. God created this world in a manner in which he is concealed and his presence isn't so obvious. If God's existence were to be obvious, human beings would have no choice but to follow God's dictates. This would uproot free will, condemning man to a meaningless robotic existence. By masking his existence, God creates a space for human beings to have a moral choice, to build an ethical and godly life. The opportunity to, to choose good rather than being compelled to do it engenders the immeasurable satisfaction of self-discovery, self-development, and allows a man to resemble God, who is, who is holy, holy, uh, free, and unhindered. Therefore, the Medish uses the metaphor of clothing to describe that the, shi uh, the shine of God's splendor, meaning the conspicuousness of his presence, because although one can see the form of the person wearing the clothing, if one chooses to, it also conceals um, fr from a, you know, just a, a, a simple glance. Similarly, one can ignore the reality of God, but this reality is visible if one puts an effort to see it. And that's, so you have the clothes, and it, yet, it, yet it represents that particular individual. And that is why we say, the, tal the talus is a reminder of um, the talit. It wraps around us, creates this all-encompassing presence of God, reminded God is surrounding us from all, all, um, for all aspects of our lives. And then yet at the same time, they have these individual sitsis tied to the four corners of the world, or the four corners of the, of the sitsis. And they're inserted by inserting these four strings through a hole near the corner. These represent, you have this general surrounding, ah, surrounding of the talus, and yet at the same time you have the individuality. You must remember there's an all-encompassing aspect, and yet the individual details are so important. More as we continue, but the time has grabbed us today. Wishing everybody a wonderful, safe week, and of course, a very happy and good news the new month of Elo begins this coming Tuesday and Wednesday. Wishing everybody a very happy, healthy, and sweet New Year. Expressed on air are not necessarily those of WHBC, its management, or Nassau Community College. Responsible opposing viewpoints will be considered by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu or by mail at whpc One Education Drive, Garden City, New York 11530. Thanks for listening to the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.